you. Sounds, sounds good. Hey, um, hello, good. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is our first edition of uh, lecture. And today we have the honor uh, to uh, be with Professor Bill Morgan and Dr. Dea will uh, open up our session with a case presentation. And I think, I believe the topic of tonight will be about around normal tension glaucoma. So please, Dr. Dea, would you thank like you to so share much. your slide? Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Tria. Wait a minute. Is my slide visible? Uh, yes, we can see it. Okay, may I start the presentation? Yes, please. Thank you. Good evening, professors, doctors, consultants, and fellow residents. Welcome to Australian Indonesian Glaucoma Lecture. My name is Dia, a second year ophthalmology resident in Universitas Indonesia. Tonight, I'd like to present a case about normal tension glaucoma. This is a seven year long case of our patient in Glaucoma Outpatient Clinic, Cipto Maun Kusumo Hospital, Jakarta. Our patient is a 66-year-old female. She came to the clinic with the chief complaint of blurry vision of her left eye two years prior to the visit. She noticed the complaint when she was doing nearsighted activities, such as reading. There was no complaint of redness of the, the eye, watery eye, painful eye, smoky vision, curtain sight, floaters, nor nausea or vomiting. Sometimes she complained of her left eye feeling weary and sore. She never visited an ophthalmologist before for her complaints. Therefore, there was no previous eye medication. Patient had history of hypertension on treatment, which was amlodipine one times um, 10 milligrams daily that she had been taking for over five years regularly. She also had asthma, but without exacerbation. And also she had an uncontrolled dyslipidemia. No history of recurrent migraine, heart disease, stroke, thyroid disease, coagulation abnormalities, any autoimmune diseases, or other systemic vascular diseases. She also denied any allergies, long-term steroid use, smoking, or alcohol consumption. Patient had never wore spectacles before and no previous ocular surgery. History of trauma and prior blood transfusion was denied. During general screening, blood pressure was around um, 140 over 90 millimeter hydrogerum. This is patient's ophthalmological status. Her best corrected visual acuity was 6 over 6 in her right eye and 2 over 60 in her left eye. Initial, initial intraocular pressure in the right eye was 14 and in her left eye was 11. No inflammation or pigmented lesion was detected in the anterior chamber. We also performed gonioscopic examination to confirm the angle configuration. It was revealed that the angle was open in all quadrants in both eyes. Here is the fundoscopic examination, and we can see there's a cap, um, vertical cap ratio enlargement in both eyes. There's um, around 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 uh, C the ratio on the right eye with cupping and nasalization. Also, a bigger C the ratio in her left eye, which was a 0 0.8 to 0 0.9. There was no hemorrhages or signs of ischemia in both eyes. To support our diagnosis, we perform optical coronary tomography and Humphrey visual field examination. Patient's OCT examination revealed normal neuroretinal rim in right eye, and there was a remarkable thinning of superior and temporal quadrant in the left eye. Average uh, retinal nerve fiber layer thickness was also thinner in left eye compared to the right eye. Examination of the patient's visual field was reliable. Right eye showed no significant visual field defect with specific pattern. However, there was inferior arcuate defect in the left eye. This finding corresponds with the OCT result. We also uh, performed the pachymetry or to evaluate corneal central thickness uh, to confirm the accuracy of IOP measurement, with thinner corneas giving a falsely low reading while thicker corneas yields a falsely higher reading. Apparently, both corneal thickness were determined thin, one, uh, 511 microns in right eye and 488 microns in left eye, indicating uh, there possibly might be underestimation of IOP measurement using tonometry. 
After thorough examinations, we diagnosed the patient with normal tension glaucoma of both eyes and senile immature cataract of both eyes. We plan to begin initial therapy with betaxolol hydrochlorate 0.5% two times daily to both eyes. To evaluate the efficacy and therapy, we advise patients to control to our outpatient clinic in one month. We also advise the patient to consult to internist to routinely monitor her blood pressure and lipid profile to get appropriate medication regard regarding her systemic condition. This is the ophthalmological status on her, uh, her first follow-up in one month. IOP was 12 in right eye and 15 in left eye. There was no changes in the uh, other anterior or posterior segment examination. So we decided to continue the medication and advise her to control in two months. Fast forward to 2018, three years after the initial visit, IOP fell below 15 in both eyes with combination therapy of betaxolol and latanoprost. The combination therapy was started back in 2017 due to slight increase of IOP, even though she had been using betaxolol regularly. Cap disc ratio remained the same as well. We did another yearly ancillary examination to evaluate glaucoma progression. Um, however, in 2018, uh, OCT data was not found in the medical record. But oh, we uh, can see that this Humphrey, the result of Humphrey and the right eye, shared similarity with the examination in 2015. Still no significant visual field defect. Humphrey on the left eye remained uh, relatively the same since previous year of evaluation and did not show any progression of visual field defect. So... Um, during this time, patient began to complain about more hazy and smoky vision during this period. So we plan to do cataract extraction and IOL implantation. Before the, the surgery, we perform a retinometry to assess visual equity improvement. The result turned out well, so we executed phaco emulsification of left eye in two months after the visit. Phaco on the right eye was done later in 2019. This is the latest follow-up of patient in December 2022. The CVA of the right eye improved to 6, after, uh, six over 6 after cataract surgery, even though left eye remained uh, the same. IOP was greatly controlled below 15 mm hydrogerum on both eyes, and patients still regularly applying combined glaucoma medications. So uh, during uh, 2018 to 2022, patient used two glaucoma medication that was uh, betaxolol and uh, latanoprost. This is the latest supporting examination, which showed there was uh, a bit progression of RNFL thinning on left eye, but right eye remained relatively the same. Humphrey of both eyes also revealed similar results from the uh, initial visit. We still advise the patient to control regularly to our outpatient clinic every three months with the same medication. To conclude the seven years of glau this glaucoma journey, this is the IOP progression of the patient. We can see a peak uh, in IOP within year one and two during her medication was only betaxolol. Then IOP started to decrease after the addition of latanoprost of both eyes. I mean IOP of the right eye was slightly higher than the left eye, but both remained below 15 mm hydrogerum. OCT showed progression of RNFL thinning on left eye after seven years from only superior temporal thinning to superior temporal and inferior thinning. However, right eye did not progress even though mean IOP was slightly higher than the left eye. Humphrey on right eye showed no significant visual field defect even after seven years, and Humphrey on the left eye showed no progression of visual field defect. I think uh, that concludes the tonight case presentation. Once again, thank you for having me to represent Universitas Indonesia for this month's Australian Indonesian Glaucoma Lecture Series. Thank you for your attention, and now we can proceed to lecture session from Prof. Morgan. Can I, Tr Tria, can I yeah. ask a question of Durrani, could you go back to the colour photograph at the close to the beginning of the slide? I'm sorry, uh, what photograph? On this go photograph? back to the, to the retinal photographs, mm -hmm. the colour retinal, yeah, correct. This one? Um, and can you tell us why you think the visual acuity was so poor on the left side? Um, there was probably um, reducing in the macular reflex on the left eye. If we compare to the right eye, yep. Um, 
What about the blood vessels? Do, do you mind looking at the blood vessels on that left side? Perhaps the retinal arterioles in particular, particularly in the superior macular distribution. Yeah. Do, do you detect a difference, if you like, between the ones in the left eye compared to the ones in the right? Mm. So to, there's a sign called sheathing where there is, if you like, whitening of the vessels. Do you see that in the superior vessels in the macula? The superior vessels, the, wait, is it around here? But they look more white. Yeah, white tissue. Yeah. And if you look across the other side, on the yeah. right-hand side, they have that more normal where you can actually see the blood column, whereas... You can't actually see the blood column on the left side. So, and now the optic disc looks cupped and excavated. And on OCT scanning, you can actually see the cupping as well. So there probably is an element of glaucoma here, but I'm mm. suspicious that there may be a vascular issue affecting the macula, causing the uh, visual acuity loss. So um, mm. the reason for asking the question is it's unusual to get uh, for patients to present with very marked visual acuity loss in the setting of moderate or even moderately severe glaucoma uh, without some other explanation. I mean, it can happen, but um, I think it's a wonderful case you've presented. It highlights that, um, if you like, a conundrum that you have if you see a patient with reduced visual acuity um, with signs of glaucoma, then perhaps you've also got to look for other features as well. Now, mm -hmm. the visual field didn't change at all over those years, which implies that this uh, retinal pathology, or vascular pathology probably did not change. And also there's probably an element of glaucoma here on the left side, as you say, a sort of normal tension glaucoma, which has also probably remained stable. Um, so, the, so I think it's a really interesting <laughs> case history. Sorry, Tria, I hope I didn't, you don't mind me interrupting asking those questions. That's all right, bro. It's, it's interesting. It could be a, a, some uh, secondary to his hypertensive condition, but patient doesn't have hypertension. She had controlled hypertension on antihypertensive. Yeah, yeah. Yes, patient had a uh, hypertension and she was on a uh, amlodipine medication, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, you're right, Prof. It, it probably contributes to the central vision, uh, the poor central vision in this patient as well, which uh, improved actually on after FACO. Uh, but I don't know, did, do we have like a fundus picture of his post op FACO? No, yeah, Dr. Dea. Now, actually, this is the fundus photograph uh, recently that we don't regularly perform um, documentation of fundus photography in our glaucoma patients. So this was uh, I took um, a month uh, ago for, uh, for the patient's last visit. So, yeah, maybe this is also the her disease progression of maybe um, accompanying hypertensive retinopathy. Hmm. I, I, I cheated. I, I forced Durrani to show these photographs at the beginning just to give the audience a, a taste, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but it tickles me also. Maybe it's probably, um, yeah, we have to uh, think maybe there's a, a hypertensive ret retinopathy also, Prof, perhaps in this case. Poss possibly, yeah, 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 possibly. You, you want to. Uh, uh, do the lecture, oh, yes. Prof. Maybe yes. Thank you. we can, uh, if if the participant has questions, we can uh, uh, discuss it also together after the lecture. Uh, please, Professor Morgan. Thank you very much. I'll just bring up my. Oh, where did it go to? Oh, here it is. Ah, oh, yeah. And can everyone see the screen? Yes, thanks. Thanks very much. So thank you for asking me to talk on normal tension glaucoma. 
So it's a funny name, actually. Uh, probably, probably we shouldn't even use that name, but we'll talk about it. Everyone does talk about it. So we, we don't want to be left out of the conversation. So we'll, we, we talk about normal tension glaucoma. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the basic epidemiology of pressure and glaucoma, and perhaps whether there are non-pressure factors in so-called normal tension glaucoma. It's one of those long-standing questions. And then because it's pressure is in the name, and obviously pressure is in the forefront of how we think about the disease, I'll talk a little bit about the pressure distribution across uh, the eye and how this might influence the glaucoma. And I've just got this slide from a famous histological section done by Vrabeck in the late 1960s showing sprouting of ganglion cells where they've been damaged within the lamina cribrosa, pretty much demonstrating that the site of injury in any glaucoma is at the lamina cribrosa. Now, when we think of normal tension glaucoma, this is the classic kind of example. And it's a little bit similar to the image that uh, Dirani showed. So here we have a somewhat cupped optic disc. We've got excavation superiorly and inferiorly. We've got a disc rim hemorrhage. We've also got visual field loss that's close to the center of fixation. Um, we have got normal blood vessels, et cetera, at least macroscopically normal here um, in this eye. So this is the sort of classic picture. Uh, people tend to think about disc rim hemorrhages and uh, visual field loss close to fixation. Not that that's a hard and fast rule, but there probably is some tendency towards that with so-called normal tension glaucoma. There have been several uh, large population studies. This is a nice summary of this, many of the studies. And you'll see that many of them have been done in South Asia and East Asia. And that's because that's where normal tension glaucoma is most common. And you'll see the proportion of the glaucoma population with so-called normal tension glaucoma is in the 70s, 80s, even 90% in parts of East Asia in particular, whereas in the uh, United States, Europe, Australia, it's closer to 30%. Now we're talking about so-called normal tension glaucoma. What is the normal pressure or tension in the eye? This was a famous study done by Fred Hollows and Peter Graham in the 1960s in England, and they measured the pressure in several thousand village, uh, people living in a village in Wales. And this was the distribution in black in the normal subjects. And you'll see that the mean intraocular pressure was about 15.5 and the standard deviation was two and a half, which meant that 95% of people had pressures between about 10 and 21 millimeters of mercury. Now it was somewhat skewed to the right, they also diagnosed glaucoma in a number of these people. And you'll see in the white bars, the distribution of pressure in those diagnosed with glaucoma. And you'll see about one third, maybe slightly more, had pressures less than 21. And it was considered that the normal pressure range was 10 to 21. So those ones were classed as having normal tension or normal pressure glaucoma because their pressure was in the normal range. So that's how the phrase came about. And it was considered that the subjects with elevated pressure above 21 had so-called high tension glaucoma. Now, just going back to glaucoma in general, what's the relative risk of getting glaucoma? That is a visual field defect or damage to the optic disc, depending upon your baseline pressure. Well, this was a famous um, effectively meta-analysis by Sommer published some quite some years ago, looking at the relative risk of developing glaucoma at four years following an, a pressure measurement. And if you assign the relative risk as one at less than 16 millimeters of mercury pressure, you'll see that it's an actually an exponential function. So by the time you get a pressure 
greater than 30, the risk of getting glaucoma has risen by about 40 times. And it's not a linear function, it's an exponential function. And that led to, well, it didn't lead to, but was um, that effectively geometric function between pressure and risk of loss was confirmed on several other studies like the early manifest glaucoma treatment trial and others. And if you look at uh, the risk of developing glaucoma or progressing in glaucoma, um, what was found in the early manifest glaucoma treatment trial was that for every millimeter of mercury pressure rise, you had a risk of about increased risk by about 10 to 11 percent of progression or increased progression. So that follows the line between the yellow and the green bars there. So it, it mirrors the result shown by Sommer in the previous slide as an exponential function. Now, the problem with some patients is that they don't all sit on, say, the yellow line or the green line. Some people sit on the red line where their risk of developing glaucoma, even at moderately high pressures, is actually quite low. So they've got tough optic nerves, if you like. And on the other side of the spectrum are patients, for example, in the orange, where their risk of getting glaucoma is quite high and their chances of progressing uh, with moderately elevated pressures or even pressures in the so-called normal range is relatively high. So those people probably have more fragile optic nerves. And the question is, why do they have fragile optic nerves? And is there anything we can do to reduce that fragility. Now, I've listed a few things that are thought to be related to fragility of the optic nerve. So the more fragile your nerve, the more likely you are to be on the curve, like the orange curve, whereas the tougher your nerve, the more likely you are to be on the red. And that would obviously be ideal for many of our patients. The most famous study looking at normal tension glaucoma was conducted by Stephen Drance and others. The, and it was the Collaborative Normal Tension Glaucoma Treatment Study published in about 2000 in several papers. And what it showed was that women were more likely to develop normal tension glaucoma and progress with it. Those with migraines, for some reason, were more likely to progress. And those also with disc hemorrhages, particularly multiple disc hemorrhages, were more likely to progress. They looked at the um, rate of progression in patients with untreated normal tension glaucoma. And this is a really interesting graph. Essentially, if you're on that horizontal line where it's zero to zero, that means that there's no progression. If you're above the line, you in fact got slightly better sensitivity results on the field test with time. If you're below that line, you progressed slightly and the radii, so out to say 0 point, minus 0 0.5 means you're progressing at about uh, minus 0 0.05 decibels per year and you can see minus one and minus 1.5. What it showed was that the average rate of progression untreated was about minus 0.4 decibels per year. Question is, how does this compare to other forms of glaucoma, such as the normal, the usual high tension glaucoma. Now, the problem, one problem is that every study tends to generate slightly different results. So the comparative trial by Hale, Anders Hale, actually mixed some uh, pseudoexfoliation with primary open angle glaucoma. And pseudoexfoliation is known to be more aggressive. So they found a treated uh, rate of progression of about point, minus 0.8 decibels per year, so significantly faster. Demarais used just primary open angle glaucoma patients, found about 0.45 decibels per year. Now, these studies had similar average intraocular pressures, so that's another factor to consider, as well as other uh, risk factors. So, normal tension glaucoma untreated is probably at the lower end of the 
aggressive spectrum on average. But you can see that some people progress quickly at about minus two decibels per year, which can be catastrophic for them. So just to summarize some of Drantz's famous uh, findings, uh, migraine was a risk factor, disc hemorrhage certainly was, and being a female was, and Asians, East Asians in particular, had a, well, they had a slower rate of progression, but they were more likely to develop normal tension glaucoma. Um, the normal tension glaucoma untreated progression varied quite a lot, but on average was relatively slow. So more studies have been conducted. This quite nice paper by Lee and Kim from South Korea found that blood pressure is a, a significant factor. So if you have low blood pressure, you're more likely to progress. So for example, the Kaplan-Meier survival curve, a red bar were those with a systolic blood pressure greater than 107. And the green and blue bars had systolic blood pressures less than 107. And the blue had that low blood pressure plus uh, disc rim hemorrhages. So they tended to progress the fastest. So there is something to do with having low blood pressure, which can be involved in making you more likely to develop glaucoma. The other th factor they found was diabetes appeared to be possibly related to uh, normal tension glaucoma, but that hasn't been really confirmed with other studies. So I think that's something to not necessarily believe in toto. Another group looked at spontaneous venous pulsation as a risk factor, and this reflects venous pressure in the retinal circulation. They found that it tended to be higher. Um, now, when you say the, uh, the rate of spontaneous pulsation drops if venous pressure is elevated. So that's why that graph on the right-hand side goes down with more severe normal tension glaucoma. Now, our own study into this back in 2004 found the same finding in uh, all glaucomas. So your usual high tension and normal tension glaucoma. So I suspect that's not really a differential finding, but just a a uh, characteristic of glaucoma that you tend to get elevated uh, venous pressures. So the vascular pressures, low blood pressure, which is also a risk factor for primary open angle glaucoma, appears uh, a factor for normal tension glaucoma. Elevated venous pressures, the same as for primary open angle glaucoma. Disc hemorrhages are more common in glaucoma in general, they appear to be more common in normal tension glaucoma, but that might be partly an artifact because those hemorrhages probably last for longer and may be larger and so are more visible when the intraocular pressure is lower. So that's a difficult to know if they're actually more common in normal tension glaucoma. It's difficult to know about migraine. It's, uh, I can't find other studies that have looked at migraine in normal tension glaucoma. And then there are some more recent studies that look at nocturnal blood pressure, vasospasm. And again, they're not really confirmed by multiple studies. So it's difficult to comment on these suggestions. But certainly blood pressure uh, and disc rim hemorrhages and venous pressures are altered in uh, both glaucoma and normal tension glaucoma. Now, this, one, this paper looked at the risk of developing normal tension glaucoma, certain factors. So it's much more likely if you're older, see that red star up there. Interestingly, if you're on medications for hypertension, you're more likely to get normal tension glaucoma. So think about the case that Durrani has just presented where that patient was on treatment for hypertension. Um, so that's an interesting factor. Also, the more severe your disease is, the more likely you are to progress. So here they've used nerve fiber layer thickness as a proxy for disease severity. And then interestingly, they found, they did OCT scans and measured lamina cribrosa thickness and found that thinner lamina cribrosa was associated with normal tension glaucoma. 
What about the risk of going blind from normal tension glaucoma? So this is a nice study that's come out of Japan relatively recently. And the risk of going blind in uh, one eye, so not both, but one eye at 20 years is around about 30%. Whereas the risk of going blind in both eyes at 30 years is around about 10%. So there is a risk, but it's relatively low. These were all well-treated patients, by the way, so they're not untreated. So obviously it's worse in an untreated population. So the risk factors for progressing to blindness in this study were the average pressure at diagnosis. So the higher the pressure at diagnosis, the worse the prognosis. The worse the disease at diagnosis, which is kind of obvious, the worse, uh, the greater the risk of going blind. Um, if you had to change the pressure lowering medications frequently, then that was another risk factor, which I think really just means that the disease was hard to manage. And again, similarly, if you required drainage surgery, you were more likely to go blind from the glaucoma, which again means that they had more aggressive disease, I think. Now, with, more recently, there's been some interesting work looking at the genetics of glaucoma in general. Very few papers on the genetics of normal tension glaucoma, but interestingly, a nice uh, review article by Janie Wiggs recently has found that there are at least one gene, perhaps the LRP12 gene also, is linked to normal tension glaucoma. Um, they both have to do with some structural uh, features within the optic disc, that is cup to disc ratio for the, I can't, can hardly say it, CDKN2-BAS gene, an optic nerve area for the LRP12 gene. And also both of those genes have some links to Alzheimer's disease, but then again, quite a few genes do. But it's interesting that they have some links to structural features in, within the optic disc. It's also worth noting that mitochondrial encoding genes appear to be important for primary acnangle glaucoma in general. We'll just touch on myopia. Myopia in this um, meta-analysis was very significantly associated with primary acnangle glaucoma in general. And it's clearly much more common in the East Asian, South Asian populations where normal tension glaucoma is especially common. And there's some interesting work by Hans-Peter Killer from Switzerland, looking at the CSF flow along the optic nerve, demonstrating that perhaps there's some stagnation or reduced flow of the CSF along the subarachnoid space around the nerve in patients with normal tension glaucoma. <laughs> Excuse me. Normally, there, is, there are lymphatic vessels behind the eye, which actually extract some of the CSF. And Hans-Peter is suggesting that perhaps that process is altered in normal tension glaucoma. No one really knows, so it's difficult to say much more on that particular topic. What we do know is that reducing intraocular pressure uh, does work to slow down the disease. So this again was from uh, Stephen Drantz and others famous collaborative normal tension glaucoma study showing that if you exclude cataract, then the effect of treatment does slow down the disease. So you can see this Kaplan-Meier survival curve is quite significantly demonstrating that. So let's touch on pressure in general across the optic nerve. So normal tension glaucoma is defined by just the eye pressure. It's not considering the pressure acting on the optic nerve or the force in response to the pressure itself. It's purely uh, defined by one single measurement. And so that's my main complaint about its sort of use as a term, but it's so well entrenched in the literature that we, we all talk about it. What about the pressure behind the eye? 
which is dominated by the cerebrospinal fluid pressure. So cerebrospinal fluid pressure is known to be reduced slightly in patients with normal tension glaucoma from a famous study done by John Burdahl at the Mayo Clinic uh, about 14 years ago. If you look at prospective measurements, again, you find that the CSF pressure is reduced in patients with normal tension glaucoma from Beijing in China. Uh, and if you, these uh, measurements of CSF pressure were done with a subject lying down. If you um, translate them into measurements at eye level with the patient sitting at the stit lamp, you can get a corrected measurement for the CSF pressure at eye level. Um, and again, you see that the pressure normal tension glaucoma patients, CSF pressure is, is lower. Now, the reason for talking about all of this is that work that we've done in the laboratory here in Perth at the Lions Eye Institute has shown that the pressure gradient, uh, which is the difference in pressure and how it's distributed between the eye and the CSF pressure, is distributed across the lamina cribrosa because the lamina cribrosa separates those two pressure compartments. And the pipette measurements we did in dogs, here you can see that from a depth of tissue from 200 to 600 microns, so over about 400 microns, the pressures fell uh, across that range, uh, even when the intraocular pressure was elevated. And that typically the, what we call the retrolaminar tissue pressure was about four millimeters of mercury, 3.7 millimeters of mercury. Uh, and it stayed fairly constant as long as the CSF pressure was low, typically zero. Now, you're, you're probably wondering why I'm talking about this, but if we look at patients who got glaucoma, as well as those who are normal, if we measure their lamina cribrosa thickness, typically in, a hu in the, uh, Human, the lamina cribrosa about and sixty, maybe five hundred microns. The Whereas if that thickness down to about 200 micron. And it's known that the pressure gradient affects axonal transport and affects the ganglion cell axon function. So it's probably a very important factor causing damage to the axons and leading to the damage which we saw with Vrabex histology at the beginning of the talk. Now, all of this is significantly worse in myopes. This was histology done by Joss Jonas, who did the other work as well. And you'll see here the lamina cribrosa is very thin in a myope. And so you'll see in a highly myopic eye that's normal, that is, doesn't have detectable glaucoma, the lamina is already thin down to about 200 microns, whereas in the glaucoma group, it's down to about 77 microns, so very, very thin indeed, compared to about 457 in uh, the normal subjects. So if we plot some numbers and imagine we were doing those pipette experiments in, in a patient and calculate what the translaminar pressure gradient is, we, we can have a bit of fun. So. Let's say that in the human, it's a little bit similar to the dog, the starting point for the lamina cribrosa is about 200 microns into the pre-lamina tissue. And that typically the thickness of the lamina is about 450 microns. Then in the normal situation, if your pressure is 15, eye pre intraocular pressure is 15, and the CSF pressure is zero, then your retrolaminar tissue pressure will be close to four or five. And the gradient across the lamina will be 20 millimeters of mercury per millimeter of tissue. If you elevate that pressure up to 25,
then the gradient will double to 40. Let's suppose that over time, gradually, this heightened pressure and gradient starts to damage the nerve and that the lamina cruporosa gets compressed and thinned to about half its thickness. So now the gradient goes from 40 to 80 millimetres of mercury per millimetre of tissue. And you will recall that one of the risk factors from one of those studies was a thin lamina cribrosa. So it starts to make sense that this is actually what's happening in some of our patients, as well as those patients who are myopic with known uh, thin lamina cribrosa. So let's suppose we make the diagnosis of glaucoma in this patient and their pressure is 25, so it's elevated, but it's not huge. And we treat that with some drops and we bring it down to 15. So it's in the normal range now, but, and we think we've done a fantastic job. We've normalized things. However, the gradient has dropped from 80 down to 40 millimeters of mercury per millimeter of tissue, which is still about twice the normal. So this patient may well still progress, even though we've got the pressure down. And that's a problem. And in fact, this probably explains a lot of so-called normal tension glaucoma, where these people simply start at this kind of situation. Either they're short-sighted, they've, or they've got a thin lamina cribrosa, or they've got some other issue which effectively exacerbates the pressure gradient going down the lamina cribrosa and makes them more vulnerable. What other pressure factors are there? Well, there are actually more than just this. The reason why the pressure, the retrolaminar tissue pressure is about four or five when the CSF pressure is zero is because of the piemata. And the piemata acts a bit like an elastic band or a sausage skin around the optic nerve. Now, if that weakens as you get older, then that compressive effect will probably reduce. And so the difference will possibly also reduce, allowing the retrolaminar tissue pressure to fall more. Another factor is that the orbital pressure tends to actually dominate the subarachnoid space pressure when you're sitting or standing. Uh, no one's actually been able to measure this property but it explains the difference between the CSF pressure and the optic nerve subarachnoid space pressures when the CSF pressure falls below about minus two millimeters of mercury. Um, and it's actually the only explanation that we can think of. So if your orbital pressure is quite low, uh, that may actually drag the whole pressure down even more and exacerbate the gradient. So orbital tissue pressure has only been measured a few times. You have to put needles in the eye and it's actually quite difficult to stop the needles getting blocked in order to measure the pressure. Um, and it's actually difficult to know what it really is physiologically, but it's probably zero or slightly sub-atmospheric uh, because that would explain why the eye is sort of sucked back into the orbit. Now, actually, I won't go into this because it's a bit complicated physiology, but I will show you this photograph of one of my patients who's elderly. Remember that age is a factor for normal tension glaucoma, and you'll see how her eyes have sunken right back. So her orbital tissue pressure is probably really quite low, maybe minus five, minus six millimeters of mercury. It's sort of sucking the eyeball back, basically. And this is possibly a factor which aggravates her glaucoma. She had progressing glaucoma, even with well-controlled intraocular pressures. And again, I just showed this slide just to reiterate that point possibly about orbital pressure and PMR. So normal tension glaucoma is basically, I think, a form of primary open angle glaucoma, uh, but it, almost certainly involves the patient having a more fragile optic nerve um, and or uh, factors that are difficult to measure, which exacerbate the gradient across the lamina cribrosa, such as um, low CSF pressure 
or uh, other factors like low orbital pressure or PMATA properties that um, reduce the retrolaminar tissue pressure. Some vascular factors are probably relevant, such as low blood pressure, being on antihypertensives, perhaps overly aggressive um, hypertension treatment may be a factor in some patients. And I think the case that uh, Durrani presented, I was very pleased to see that she measured the systemic blood pressure and reported on that early on in the case. So retinal venous pressure is increased, uh, but it also is increased in uh, primary open angle glaucoma. It's difficult to say what role migraine really has to play. Uh, I, I, I really can't say anything more about that, but it's interesting. Myopia is probably a factor. Uh, we talked about CSF pressure and orbital pressure. Two things. The, the treatment that is known to work is to lower the intraocular pressure further. So that's really all about reducing that gradient across the lamina cribrosa. That's the single factor which will work probably also monitoring the blood pressure. The prognosis varies, but it's generally pretty good. However, it varies. So some patients will progress rapidly. So like any glaucoma, you really need to find out what the individual is going to do. So you can't say they've got normal tension glaucoma, they're not going to progress. So I'll do a visual field in a year's time. I think you have to do moderately frequent visual fields in the first few years to get a, an understanding of how that particular patient is going and disease wise. Also the imaging, if you have access to imaging uh, to get another handle on the likely rate of progression in that particular patient. Oh, and that's the end of my talk. Tria, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. A very interesting um, to topic. NTG is always uh, something that we feel like we don't get a really a grasp on how it happened, but it uh, it's real. And we have some patients also in our, our clinic that are sometimes uh, a bit difficult to manage and uh, uh, yeah to control. I mean to to monitor since. Um, the pressure is uh, low already. Um, do we have questions? I think in the chat box, there, are, there is one question, Prof. Maybe we should start from there. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is Afan. Uh, dear Professor Morgan, I would like to ask a few questions. Vascular factor due to hypoperfusion of the short posterior ciliary artery is one of the mechanism of NTG. What distinguishes it from optic atrophy due to AION? In cases with uh, ONH findings that are less specific for uh, GON, how do we distinguish them from other atrophic uh, optics? And are the OCT parameters such as uh, the BMO, MRW, or anterior laminar depth reliable enough to differentiate the two entities? Uh, thank mm -hmm. you, Prof. Yeah, uh, that's a, a really good question. And in fact, it, uh, you could easily spend another hour talking about this. I'll try and be short. I, I, I think simplistically, the easiest way of, I think, accurately understanding glaucoma is that it is largely a mechanical disease wherein it's a pressure uh, effect of the lamina cribrosa gradient causing a force which pushes the uh, lamina cribrosa and, and compresses it and crushes the nerve fibers. So what you do need to see generally is excavation and notching of the optic nerve. If you don't see that, but you're getting atrophy of the nerve. That is the nerve fiber layer is thinning on OCT scanning and you're getting some visual field change. If you do not see excavation, then I think you have to think about other forms of ischemic or other, other optic neuropathies. Mm -hmm. So 
it's it's the sign of mechanical damage so compression distortion what we call a characteristic optic nerve change so remember the uh, typical definition of glaucoma is an optic neuropathy with characteristic optic nerve change associated with visual field or functional loss which matches that change so you really do need to go hunting for excavation now what i I, I think that in this day where we tend to look for the OCT scan and rely on that a lot, we're in danger of making that misdiagnosis possibly even more than we were in days gone by. And I think it's really important to always look carefully yourself at the slit lamp with the 60 diopter or other lens, looking at, for excavation and cupping, not necessarily to rely on the OCT scanning. Now, the OCT scanning is still helpful. You, it'll pick up a nerve fiber layer loss. Uh, and also you could see from the case that um, Diriani presented where the profile through the optic nerve showed that classic kind of deep U-shaped valley in the nerve. And that's, that's it. that is excavation. So that made me more comfortable that at least one element of the diagnosis was correct. There was an element of glaucoma operating. So if I don't see that, if it's more a V-shaped or a shallow cup, then I'm more concerned about the diagnosis. Now, the problem is in high myopia, where you've got a very large peripapillary scleral crescent or atrophy, uh, where the peripapillary or the sclera around the optic disc is very thin, that'll actually blow backwards as well. And in those patients, often the optic nerve subarachnoid space is widened, almost sucking the whole thing in. So you won't get a differential excavation. You'll get a sort of posterior staphyloma um, in that region. And so it can be, I think, difficult to see the mechanical effect in some patients with very high myopia, and that can be tricky. The other situation which I think is classically difficult is when the optic discs are very, very small and you just get a very small amount of excavation or change, um, which can be significant as well. So it, I, I, there's no easy answer. Um, I have resorted to electrophysiology at times, but even then it's not, usually you don't get a clear answer. I think you, you really have to go by clinical feel and if the intraocular pressure is elevated, then generally there's no harm in treating that if you think that there's an element of glaucoma operating. Whereas with most of the other optic neuropathies, there's no treatment. So at least you're potentially treating a uh, treatable component of their disease. Sorry, that's a terribly long answer to your question, and I'm not sure if I've helped you that much. No, but that's very important, Prof. So excavation is something that we need to... Uh, look for is there any cupping I think uh, that could probably be helpful to differentiate uh, an optic atrophy in glaucoma and non-glaucoma for uh, interesting uh, reminder uh, we don't have any questions at the chat box anymore anybody wants to uh, ask live it's also uh, possible but in the meantime prof if I may ask you a question um, this is probably my question is a bit more clinical, Prof. Um, how do you treat normal tension glaucoma? I mean, do you, um, do you make a target pressure uh, like you do in probably primary open angle glaucoma? And, and do you make a point on checking pressure in other times for uh, possible oh. diurnal variations? Yeah, yeah, good questions. Um... Yeah, exactly. So I do set a target pressure and I will do a, uh, I used to do phasing during the day or even overnight, but that is very difficult to organize and hard to believe the measurements, depending upon the staff you have to actually take the measurements. Now I do a water drinking test, which I think is a reasonable proxy for what you really want to do is see if there's significant fluctuation or significant rise in intraocular pressure. And the water drinking test, in effect, is testing your facility of outflow indirectly. Um, so I, I do that. I, 
it, uh, the correlation is not perfect, and so it's not a perfect test. In fact, so in some ways, if we had an easier way of measuring facility of outflow directly, I think that would be preferable. Um, yeah, so that's what I do. And sorry, Tri, I forget the other part of your question. Uh, you had another part. Yeah, so so uh, do you make a point to find the, the point of the day? So that you don't do like a sleep lab or, or something to check uh, in diurnal variations, Prof. You don't do that, yeah? Oh, yeah. So I'll get the patients back at different times of the day ah, and, yes. and I record the time of their visit. So we have an electronic medical record system which automatically actually records the time. So we can actually see if there's a variation. The other thing that's interesting is that I don't know if there is a device called the eye care, the home eye care. So we have some patients who bought this device and it reasonably accurately measures their intraocular pressure. And so they can take multiple measurements at home and we can actually track that over time. Professor Turpin, who has joined us in November last year, uh, he's um, expert in big data, is working on a system to, if you like, extract data from those patients and be able to present it to us. I, I could give a... That's, again, that's a whole a topic for a whole nother talk. But I think in the future, we'll have ways of patients actually measuring their own pressures. And then we'll have that data available to us, which will end up being more accurate than the sort of diurnal curves that we try and generate in the hospitals. But do you find uh, patients who have uh, bigger fluctuations, let's say the maximum and the minimum within yeah. 24 hours, is at a more risk of progression than ones who have lesser fluctuations. Yes, yes, mm. yes. And that's well proven, actually, both for normal tension glaucoma. One of those studies I showed had, that was one of the factors, but also in, in plain primary open angle glaucoma, the standard deviation or the variance in intraocular pressure is a risk factor. Even as far back as the AGES study, which was published in, in the 1990s, they found that also. So it, it's fluctuation in intraocular pressure is a fairly well-known risk factor for progression. Yeah, yeah. We have one question in the chat box, Prof, from uh, Dr. Chokorda. Uh, dear Prof, I would like to ask a question. Uh, I'm still confused about how to determine the target IOP uh, for NDG, especially uh -huh. if IOP is reduced by medication, but glaucoma is still progressing. Thank you very much. Yeah, so yeah, good question. The collaborative normal tension glaucoma treatment study used 30%, which is the sort of standard. So basically take 30% off the presenting intraocular pressure, which can be pretty low. So if somebody progresses with a pressure of, uh, sorry, presents with a pressure of say 16, what 30% of that is uh, about two millimeters. Uh, no, that's not right. Three times 16, that's about five, five millimeters of mercury. So you're aiming for about 11 or 12, which is actually pretty low, pretty hard to get to. I think getting them below 11 is reliably is pretty difficult. That's probably about my lowest target pressure. You, you may get there with surgery if you're lucky, but you can't guarantee it. Occasionally we get there with medications, but not always. But that is the... The standard way of doing it. I think you should be a bit generous to yourself. I think the other thing about normal tension glaucoma is that most of the time the prognosis is pretty good um, and it's important to monitor those patients. So you will get, I can't remember the percentage, 5% or so will be rapid progressors. So those are the ones that you definitely want to pick up in the first year or two if they're rapidly losing visual field, for example, and then really be aggressive about them. But the others, most of the others, won't progress terribly quickly. I mean, one of the problems we have is that our patients, are, in some ways, they're living too long. So I have people who are now in their 90s who have had the disease for 30 years and they're, they're running into problems now uh, with, I saw a lady yesterday who was about 90, I've seen for 25 years with normal tension glaucoma. And unfortunately, she's just lost the ability to drive because of her visual field loss. 
she can still see. So she's done reasonably well. We've kept her vision reasonably okay for 25 years. But you know, I, it's, um, that's probably a reasonable result, really. Um, yes, Prof. Um, there's one more in the chat box. You're okay to answer one yeah, more? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah absolutely. Um, uh, Dr. Felicia Sessi asked, uh, when should we consider to do surgery to treat NTG? And second question, how do we adequately monitor the progression? How, how often should we do visual field tests? Thank you. Yeah. So, so I'll answer the second question first. Um, monitoring, ideally, in an ideal world, if we had a million visual field machines with the technicians, you know, all paid and working hard, etc. In every hospital, we do at least three visual field tests per year for the first two years. Um, that's really the gold standard. We have trouble doing that in Australia. Um, and I think it's a problem everywhere in the world. But that's really what you would want to do. You'd, you want to do at least two a year if you can for the first two years to get a handle on whether that patient is progressing or not. Um, and with the imaging, OCT scanning, I don't do that as frequently. I do it annually unless I think they're progressing and then I'll do it more often. But um, some people might do it every six months for the first two years and then back off. Um, that's probably reasonable. Now, if the patient's progressing and you've lowered, they're on maximal medical therapy, and uh, then I think you consider surgery. I don't generally bother with selective laser trabeculoplasty in normal tension glaucoma. I don't think it works very well. You don't tend to get much of a pressure drop in my experience. So, I mean, I sometimes will offer it to patients if they're very nervous about surgery, but I don't generally do it. Um, and the other issue is which surgery do you do? Trabeculectomy is probably still the gold standard, I think, because you tend to get a lower pressure with trabeculectomy. Um, but then, I mean, the rest of it depends on how they go with trabeculectomy. Prof, do you do deep sclerectomy? Uh, no, I don't. I, I stick to either myself, just doing either a Zen stent or a trabeculectomy or a GDD, pretty much is what I do. I... We, it's just something that we don't tend to do in Australia for some reason. It, in Some people I know in Europe, there are some very good uh, people who do a good deep sclerectomy. The ones I've tended to see have been done by surgeons who don't do many of them. And they, I don't think I've seen, I, my, I don't think I've seen one work for very long. Only in the, done by, um, I've, there was a surgeon from actually, Bosnia, who I saw a uh, patient of his who the deep sclerectomy is working very, very well. Um, his, his was the only one I've ever seen to work really well. So I think it depends on the surgeon, basically. Mm. Yes, thank you, Prof. Uh, one more question by Dr. Yulia. Um, she asked whether if there's a, your opinion about an NTG patient with known and treated uh, risk factor of polycythemia fera. Uh, IOP was already eight, uh, around eight to nine uh, with latanoprost once daily, but she was progressing with visual field close to tunnel vision. Is it possible to reduce IOP even more or should we look further uh, of the other risk factors? Yeah, that's a really difficult situation. Uh, I suspect you have to look for other risk factors and there's probably not much more you can do. I think it'd be dangerous to try and lower the pressure further. You could try. I, I use betaxolol sometimes in these patients. It has a calcium channel blocking effect, which does work significantly at the level of the retina. And it, it also tends to lower the intraocular pressure. Um, so I might put that sort of patient on betaxolol. But there's, there aren't any well done studies that have established its use. So it's really using it anecdotally or by gut feel. Mm -hmm. In terms of polycythemia rubrovira, 
it's possible that there are some microvascular disease occurring within the retina, a little bit like that case that Durrani presented, perhaps. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't know. Um, but that's a possibility with polycythemia with a high viscosity. So there may be some vascular factors there that in fact you can't treat. Um, it would be interesting to see a fluorescein angiogram on those that particular patient and see what the retinal perfusion is like, um, whether there are changes there. But I, I suspect there's probably not a lot you can do. Um, I'd probably try Bataxolol. I don't think I would try surgery, but I would consider a retinal opinion or uh, seeing what the fluorescein angiogram looks like. But if you have OCT angiography, that could be interesting as well. Yeah, angiography should give mm. you more information about the situation in the uh, oh. fuchsia maybe or the uh, vascularization, yeah, Prof. But may I ask your opinion, do you also use neuroprotector, Prof, and what type if you do? Uh, yeah, I don't routinely. But Taxolol is the only one I use as a quasi-neuroprotectant because of its effect on the uh, retinal blood vessels, it tends to dilate them a little bit. I don't use, there's, there was a paper that talked about bromonidine having some neuroprotective effect in normal tension glaucoma. But again, I don't think that's been replicated. Um, I, I haven't seen anything that is replicatable in terms of neuroprotection for uh, glaucoma, really. I know there's the drug that's available in Indonesia, which gets talked about from time to time. We, we don't have that in Australia. Citicoline, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's the one, citicoline. I, again, I haven't seen really large studies with that being used, so I can't really comment on that either. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, thank you, Prof. I am, uh, it's 9 p.m. in your place. Uh, and we don't have any more question. Uh, Dr. Firna, would you like to say something or maybe comment on the topic today? Thank you, Dr. Fria. Um, one thing I want to share maybe, I have a patient with a, with a very low IOP, a young patient, quite young patient with low IOP, but the disease seemed to progress. But then uh, later on, I know that the patient has a, a, a activity like a, do you know, Prof? A, a lifter, a lifter. The third year, a lifter is like yeah. I oh, like weightlifting. Yeah. Oh, yeah right. weightlifting. Oh. Yeah. Yes. So uh, yeah. So sometimes maybe things like activities, daily activities, we miss to. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, I mean to educate the patient I don't know whether the things like that will affect uh, in patient with uh, glaucoma prof but it does I see I mean I see in some patients so I don't know do you do you uh, like daily activities I know that uh, some doctors also um, have uh, even they they say that even the way uh, to sleep, yes, bro. How to live a bit about the head, and then also uh, um, other than systemic condition. I mean, uh, the systemic condition we know, like uh, hypotension and vascular dysregulation. But it is the daily activities that maybe affect uh, the disease progression. But I don't know, bro. Do you have? Uh, yeah. Do you ever um... have uh, experience with that? Yeah, I, I, look, it's a really, that's another really great question. And I was actually, again, I was really pleased to see on the case presentation that Durrani commented on uh, steroid, topical steroid use, how it was not used in that patient. So that's something else that I forgot to mention that uh, some patients will have um, allergy or problems in their eyes and they've been put on topical steroids for a year or so, stop them six months before they saw you. So the glaucoma damage has been done, but the pressure's come back down. And so you diagnose normal tension glaucoma. Uh, yeah, so we, I have got, I did a study some years ago where we measured pressure in people wearing swimming goggles. Well, and when you're wearing, goggles, yeah. 
Yeah, when you when you wear swimming goggles, especially the little tight ones that go around close to the eye, the intraocular pressure goes up a lot as soon as you put the goggles on. But as soon as you take them off, the pressure drops back down again. So it's not a sustained rise. I think that's probably the same for weightlifting. So it's mm. it's while they're doing the Valsalva, the pressure will go up. Mm. But as soon as they drop the weights, the pressure will go down again. And I suspect that it's probably not a huge factor because they're not in that sort of straining Valsalva position for a long time. Mm. Um, it's hard to know. There's There was this notion also that trumpet players mm. were at slightly high risk of developing glaucoma, but they're Valsalvering for longer. If they're in an orchestra playing music, then they're doing it for longer. So uh, look, it's... It's, it's interesting. It's hard to know how significant that is. Um, so with the swimming goggle study, David Mackey, who's at Lion's Eye, did a study looking at veteran swimmers and couldn't find any difference between them and their retinal nerve fibre layer thickness and a bunch of normal. So that suggested that wearing all those goggles for years, swimming up and down lengths of the pool, probably didn't make much difference. Mm. Uh, because as soon as they take the goggles off, the pressure falls back. So uh, my gut feeling is that probably all we're doing is worsening the patient's quality of life, <laughs> telling them to do things that they enjoyed, not rather telling them not to do things that they actually enjoy doing um, <laughs> for possibly no great benefit. So I don't tend to comment on, I get patients who do yoga, and they like to go upside down for yeah, five know, minutes. Yeah. And they go, oh, is it going to make my glaucoma worse? Well, I suspect not. Um, I, don't, I say, look, I'm not certain, but I suspect it's not going to adversely affect you. And I don't really want to probably, you know, potentially remove their, one of their few uh, sources of fun in life either. <laughs> yeah, I also have a patient who is a yogi, I think. So she <laughs> it will worsen her condition um, but I suppose it's just a transient uh, pressure rise maybe if if so, mm -hmm. so yeah maybe um, yeah I also don't tend to tell them to stop doing what they like <laughs> just yeah. because it may not be significantly helping them also um, but, but when you when you blink or look up or down or rub your eyes you actually the pressure goes up a lot there's a fellow in the United States, Crawford Downs, who's put um, cannulas into monkeys so that they record the pressure around the clock, 24 hours a day. And the pressure spikes that happen just by blinking or uh, changing posture a bit, they're quite large, actually. So we're, all of that's happening to us all through the day. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I, I kind of think we those sorts of transient pressure changes probably don't matter too much but i might be wrong i don't know for certain <laughs> <laughs> thank you bro thank you, yeah. thank you bro. okay so well, sorry prof you want to say something? oh no no i was just gonna say thank you it's been fun and i think i've i've talked too much i'm sorry about that <laughs> except my apology yeah, yeah please <laughs> uh, well thank you for your time prof and thank you everyone for joining us i think we will um have another session next month Right, Dr. Pirna. Yes. So hope to see you again uh, in one month's time. Uh, good. Have a good uh, evening, everyone. Have a good rest, Prof. Yes, please. Uh, maybe if 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 it's possible, can you turn on your camera so we can take oh, yeah. a picture? Um, maybe Dr. Miki. Can... Yeah, Dr. Miki, I think can help to take the pictures. Okay, sure, Dr. Mika. Uh, I'll be conducting the photo session shortly. So everyone, please turn on your camera, please. Okay, that's quite a lot. I will start now. I'll begin in one, two, three. For the next page. One, two, three. Third page, one, two, three. 
first page one two three and last page one two three okay that will be all thank you doctors okay thank you Miki. Thank you everyone have a good rest Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.